early morning and special assignment leads labor inspectors into an obscure, unnamed factory. This is one of Johannesburg's so-called sweatshops, shady, hidden, and staffed mostly by illegal immigrants who often work under appalling conditions. Manned entirely by Malawians, this factory manufactures roast peanuts and flavored corn chips. Earlier this morning, we had told the Department of Labor about a number of sweatshops around Johannesburg. This one, the inspectors say, is one of the worst they've ever seen. Two months earlier, our investigation had started in the same peanut factory. We infiltrated the premises with a spy camera. The workers complained that they often had to sleep here. On this day, there'd be no time even to wash, but it didn't stop them from handling the food. Less than a meter away from sizzling oil stoves, open wires stuck out of a faulty socket. None of the equipment had been cleaned. And workers had no uniforms. Instead, they were covered in food, dust and sweat from head to toe. Lunch and tea breaks didn't seem to be encouraged. And then the boss came in. The workers introduced him as Anaz. We later discovered that his surname was Patel and that he also has a retail shop called Snack Tack. Street hawkers buy in bulk from Patel to sell to an unsuspecting public. Anaz was worried we were from the police, so he gave an order that we must be given two kilograms of peanuts. In exchange for the bribe, we had to leave quickly before we could check his workers' illegal status. Close on the edge of Johannesburg Central Business District is Fordsburg. Streets awash with exotic sounds and the fragrance of curry and incense. Fordsburg is perhaps best known for the Oriental Plaza. This is where Indian shopkeepers were banished when the apartheid government cleaned up black spots in white suburbs in the 1970s. The community took eviction in their stride and turned Fordsburg into a commercial mecca. While shopping centers have mushroomed throughout Johannesburg, the plaza is still where bargain hunters come for best buys. At Cosmos, we give you good prices, sir. Our card, please give our business card. Please call again. Thank you very much. Please come to Cosmos again. You're most welcome. But today, the real story of Fordsburg lies in the streets beyond the bright facade of the restaurants and the plaza. It's a story of exploitation, abuse and lawlessness. Hey, look, look! Hey, ta. hey! Behind a steel door early one morning, Special Assignment's undercover journalist detects signs of life. There's no company signboard or any indication that manufacturing might take place here. Huh? Come closer. A sleepy Malawian worker has appeared from somewhere in the back. Nine o'clock. They are opening for you nine o'clock. Okay. Okay. Na, na, did you work during the day yesterday? Ah, uh, that? You you work during the day yesterday? Yeah. From what time? Eh, uh, six o'clock, nine o'clock morning. Okay. So uh, at least you got more money. You got overtime. Nothing. Nothing. No overtime. <laughs> Whether you like or not, you should have to work night shift. You see. Thereafter, they leave that place, then they lock there by the gate. Freedom of movement is an internationally recognized basic human right, but not if you work in this factory. I know. You don't work today? <laughs> the whole day? On my side, I can go to the police and they complain just because I don't have an ID. Trapped by their illegal status, and exploited by the greed of their employers. This is what life is like in a sweatshop.
If you work in this factory, you better pray a fire doesn't break out, because no one has a key to get out when the managers leave at night. If you can't carry on through the night after a full day's work, there are no sleeping quarters, except for the floor or a worn-out couch. You got a small Mercedes Benz. A nice car. So, what it, Mama? So it's knock off time now. Are you knocking off? Yeah, now we want to start now. You want to start with okay. You eat wherever you find a spot among the piles of fabric. Sure, sure, sure. That is, if you can afford food on the meager wages you earn. And right near bales of linen, cigarettes can be lit on an ancient hot plate. There's no remedy for free-floating fabric fibers, so you must contrive your own protective mask or else you can get very sick. We are feeling uh, like panning here inside the, the nose, you see. Then if we take out the mucus, we, it mix with the blood, you see. According to the materials we are using now, there is some sort of called the winter, winter, winter sheets. So it's almost everyone in that factory. Like now it's coughing, when it's blowing, it is mucus mixed with some sort of blood. How many do you do per day? This one? Yeah. Four hundred or something. Four hundred? Yeah. The packers have blisters on their fingers from stuffing linen into plastic packets that are too small. The work is repetitive and with the sheer bulk of the fabric, it's backbreaking. When we are packing, just to pack, set a set, take a bed sheet, two pillows, a bed cover, some sort of six or five pieces. So we pack it in a, a small, a small plastic. We first pack it, so we feel pain on our chest. If you are not uh, physically fit, you can't even manage to carry those things. You see, when you are making me just <coughs> relaxing, as I have work, just stretch your body. Said, hey, what are you doing? Must do fast, fast the work. You see, you have got a big order, so you must make it fast, fast. This is the man who brings in the orders, tells them when to work, and pays them. His name is Mohammed Sadiq. He prefers to hire foreigners, but if needs be, unsophisticated rural South Africans who don't insist on their rights will do. I need the village people. No, village people is a little bit stronger and yeah. quickly. Yeah. So when they when they down around that city, the city people is a little bit lazy. Very lazy. Fabric cost 24 rand. Yeah. For it, one weight cover and two pillowcases. Yeah. Okay. Special Assignments undercover reporter poses as a prospective factory owner. Sadiq tells him what it takes to turn a profit in a factory like this. So that means 26.50 your cost. Yeah. On 26 rand 50, if the fabric, as he says, costs 24 rand, stitching and packing costs 2 rand 50. No matter how cheap or expensive the fabric in this factory, labor is always 2 rand 50. Ah, today you got money. It's payday, isn't it? Yeah. You pay yesterday. No, today. They give you envelopes. No, only just cash. Cash on the hand. I mean, you don't get envelopes, writing, how much? No, 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 no. They just give cash on the hand. You see, they're just calling one guy, one guy, one guy, go and sit there in the office. And then you take your money yeah. in the pocket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how do they know you have overtime? Huh? They tell you you work overtime, or you, you have ah, to tell them. Which, which, which means it's night shift. Night shift. Because overtime. sometimes we are working maybe late time going, but nothing will get us. And this despite the fact that Tom has upgraded his skills by teaching himself how to sew. As a packer, he earned 185 rand a week. One night shift was 20 rand. Now that he can sew, he sets his own income level. But at 10 cents a sheet, there are too few hours in the day to make a living. Sometimes I make it uh, 300 or something, maybe 350, which means, which means early in the morning also, I should have to wake up early in the morning at least to get something, you see. Maybe to make it, maybe all together, must be maybe 400 or something, 500, you see. If I make it 500, which means it's a 50 rand I've made it. They pay me 150. That means uh, a day is 25 rand. So if I seek, I can say for three days, they cut 75 rand, and they also give me 75 rand. 
they can't say you are sick, they just say you are no, on a holiday. When they don't collapse of exhaustion at the factory, home is a shared room in a hostel. Rent is a week's wages. Many camera shy immigrants live here. They don't bring any belongings from the factory for fear of theft. This uprooted life reminds them of how far away home really is and how they're letting their wives and children down back in Malawi. You're giving me a little money. So how can I send home money? And I should have to pay rent as well. What about food? And I remember it's now five months before, after I found, I found her. I found her and what she told me, myself, I was about <laughs> to cry. She told me, hey, what you doing here? You want to see you. What are you doing there? What can your children do? What are you doing? Well, do you hope you are coming here with a car? As you told me, I said, oh, I forget about the car. I said, live in a bicycle, forget about that. <laughs> Just <laughs> pray to God to give me a life so that we can meet in a next so so. Incredibly, some immigrants do bring their families to try and make a life together in the city. We find an entire office block crammed with foreigners working round the clock. On the fifth floor, they invite us into one of their mini factories. It's about eight o'clock at night. They tell us they make one to three rand per dress, and they can make up to 60 dresses if they work more than 18 hour days. The shop floor has also become the kitchen and the lounge and the bedroom. A newborn baby brings the number of people in the room to eight. Yeah. You see? Under apartheid, black workers notoriously earned less than whites. But since all South Africans now have the same rights, entrepreneurs have found a new source of cheap labor, undocumented migrant workers. Paula Sitole is one such undocumented migrant, a Zimbabwean who came here in 1995 and worked illegally for five years. When I got here, I quickly found a job at Badelias. I was here for hardly two weeks. I thought he was a nice guy because it was my first job here. We signed some legal documents. We were given rules like no smoking inside. My first wages were 125 friends, then it increased to 130, then 140, and in the end, 150. This is where Polis got work in 1995. The factory belongs to Hassan Badelia. Among other ventures, Badelia manufactures bed linen and runs a wholesale enterprise. In those days, many South Africans worked at Badelia's manufacturing too. Mary Antako was one of them, a seamstress. She even trained other staff, but says she earned less than her trainees, who were all foreigners. At the beginning of 1998, we do it. We needed money, but we never got it. We quit, and when we demanded money for our services, he told us he didn't have it. He then said he didn't want to work with South Africans anymore. He wanted to work with immigrants because he too was an immigrant. He fired some of them and chose a few to stay behind. I was one of them. There were eight people left. He didn't close the firm. It was functioning day and night. Indians worked during the day. They went in to do the sewing. And at night, the boys who made the fiber went in. Many entrepreneurs resented the new labor laws and vibrant trade unions after 1994. Like many others, Badelia manufacturers seemed to go underground. He closed shop for a while, and when he reopened, he hired mostly immigrants, discouraging protest, allowing labor standards to slip in favor of profit. The machines were lethal and a lot of people got hurt. When you get hurt and you need to stay at home, they wouldn't pay you.
Badelio manufacturers make many labels, among them MAMS linen. These are the same goods we found first in Mohammed Sadiq's factory. It seems business prospered so that Badelio helped others like Sadiq set up satellite factories. Labor malpractice was thus merely replicated from Fordsburg to surrounding suburbs, with workers little more than extensions of the machines they operate. If I get a job where the money is not so good, but the working environment is good, that would be fine. We take our findings and suspicions of malpractice to the Department of Labor. Able and capable and willing to do this exercise at this time of the morning uh, and to be out there uh, to protect workers uh, in whatever way uh, is, is possible. All inspection teams strike simultaneously. At the factories we target, only one owner is present at this time of the morning. For the next two hours, Mohammed Sadiq faces a grilling about everything in his factory. From the lack of soap to wash hands, to faulty plugs, to hazardous cabling, to the obvious violation of his workers' rights. If you just work till six o'clock, where do you sleep? Just sleeping in a place. Every night? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. No blanket? This one, use this one. You just use this thing as a blanket? Yeah. And then you sleep with it? Yeah. And then you start at six, you finish at nine? Six. When you start at six o'clock, we finish at twelve, 12 o'clock. At night? Yeah. And then how do you go home? You can't go home, you have to yeah, sleep here. We, we're just sleeping here. Until he comes and opens yeah, the Yeah, and we're starting 9 o'clock again. Again? Yeah. You again? Yeah. George? We decide to move on around the corner to Hassan Badelia's factory for comment. Sadiq is, after all, Badelia's supplier. This morning, inspectors battled to get in, but by the time we arrive, they've gained access. Mr. Reinders is now using Santon right now. Business must be booming. Badelia is currently expanding into the warehouse next door. But the man himself is elusive today. When our cameras get inside, all operations have ceased. Machines are dead, and workers have all but disappeared from the premises. Have you interviewed the employees? The employees are, are all illegal. They, they don't want to talk to us. They don't want to talk to us. Uh, are they local people? They're from not foreign. local people. Foreign They're people. Foreign. All of them. Badelia is also not at his oldest factory on the other side of Fordsburg. Nonetheless, the scrutiny continues. As at all the other factories, safety seems to be his last concern. Fire escapes are blocked, and there's no running water. Hey. In Badelia's absence, several warnings must be issued. In the new factory, a raised work floor is even shut down. There should have been an emergency exit. There should have been uh, fire extinguishers in, in, in place. There is absolutely nothing. What did you it's find in terms of the fire extinguishers in this place? The, the fire extinguishers uh, have not been uh, serviced. serviced for since the, uh, 1994. Finally, Badelia arrives. Shocked at the morning's concerted onslaught on his entire operation, he first wants to speak to his managers. I don't know if you want to speak to your managers first. A short briefing later, and he's happy to tell us he will fully comply with the inspection report and get his house in order. He will even invite inspectors back regularly and work with the Department of Labor to fix the faults. But he's clearly not thrilled. I'm from Pakistan, I'm from foreign country. And I can work in Pakistan as well, but why I'm sitting here? Because I can, I can create more jobs and my better life is here as well, and a better business here. But with, with all these labor problems and labor unions, which, I mean, in their laws, which owner doesn't have any rights to say, I'm sorry to say, I, if, if it runs like this, we have to shut down and go home. But at 27 West Street, workers don't have the easy option of going home. They've slaved away all night, having earned barely enough to feed themselves today. Nonetheless, inspectors take a hard line. 
So when did it expire? Do you renew it? A factory deemed unsuitable is shut down until improvements can be made. The most radical response of the day happens within an hour of the inspector's arrival. The notorious peanut factory is summarily shut down. So what we're gonna do here, yeah. we're gonna make a walkthrough inspection, yeah. okay? Yeah. And we're gonna check yeah. all the necessary documents that is required. So there is no uh, covering of the CSD, yeah. 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 which is one of the things that we need. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Where are you from? Malawi. Malawi. Yeah. Sometimes eh, we come six o'clock. Six o'clock in the morning. In the morning, eh? After that. And then what time do you finish working? We not go for uh, sometimes we we living here. Is living? No, just living until morning. Ah, very unbearable actually. It's unacceptable in terms of environmental regulation. Actually, housekeeping is very bad. It's very bad. That's you can't continue working in this yeah. uh, with environment, okay? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> so, and then this is a contravention notice of the environmental regulation, okay? Yeah. Yeah. You can, can you sign that you have received this here? You can just sign here. Just put your signature. We are going to switch off everything here. Can you come and show me? Yeah. Minutes after the inspectors have left, factory boss Anaz Patel arrives. The factory workers describe him as the owner and the man who pays them their slave wages of less than 200 rand a week. He says the factory belongs to his cousin. But what is your relation to the factory? I'm the customer here. You buy, you buy that? Huh? No, no, I mean, like, uh, try some peanuts for me, whatever, and I go and sell it out. You buy it from him? Yeah. Are you a customer? Yeah. Back in Fordsburg, it's lunchtime. For the first time today, the Department of Labor's inspectors can sit down and collate their findings. Well, uh, firstly, let me say that uh, I'm completely horrified that the things that one saw there, I have always known that we have employers who don't comply with the legislation. But I did not think that it was to be to that extent. I'm sure those of us that have animals don't even treat them that way. Uh, and, and, and so a combination of all those regulations being violated uh, forces us not to ignore anything or not to take a sympathetic approach. So sometimes we have scarce skills that are brought in here by foreign workers and we need them, but they must be here legally. And if they are to be here illegally and then their rights are violated, law must apply. One doesn't want to see people losing their jobs under any circumstances. But surely if, if, if people are being abused the way that we saw this morning uh, and all their rights are being violated and employers are, are creating wealth out of the suffering of other people, then I don't believe we can sit back. And unfortunately, uh, in the process of dealing with these, there may be workers that will be repatriated back to their countries. Uh, there may be others that could obtain work permits. We don't know, but we believe that we cannot leave the situation as it is and we need to deal with it. Hours after the raid, Sadiq shuts his factory down. Tom and James are ready to leave anyway. After years of living here, everything they own fits into a few boxes and suitcases in a friend's garage. So as yeah, I spent here two, two years, on these two years, see that uh, I lost my everything. Yeah, lost my everything. I'm selling my body with money because of my hard work we were there in the factory, you see. As of now, I can say I'm just feeling pain in you know, the whole body. So I think maybe it's, it's fine, maybe to go back, back, go back home and see what can I do. Maybe if I want to come back again, maybe I will have a luck. One day, yeah, everything will be changed. Because you know, way to success, it's hard. Yeah, but long at last, you gain something. 